Okay, let's start now. Good morning to everybody and welcome to the Instituto de Astrofisica Andalucía seminars. Today it's, uh, it's uh, a pleasure and I have to say that I'm very proud as director of the Instituto and also as member of the ESD collaboration to introduce this seminar. As you know, uh, last week, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope showed the results about the, black, the first image of the black hole at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And in this, in this work, our institute, the Instituto institute of the Astrophysica Andalucía, played a very relevant role. It is, in fact, a, a, very, a great pleasure for me to introduce Jose Luis Gomez. Jose Luis Gomez, besides a good friend and colleague, is the leader of the Event Horizon Telescope Group here at the IAA. He's a member of the Science Council of the Collaboration and is also one of the leaders of the Imaging Working Group of the Collaboration. It, it means that his role is really very relevant within the, the whole team. Jose Luis is Investigador Científico here and in, in, at the Instituto de Astrofisica Andalucía. He, his career is focused on the study of the relativistic jets uh, of active galactic nuclear with the highest angular resolution, and in fact, making use of the, of the most important uh, networks, uh, interferometric networks in the world. I, I would like to mention especially his work on millimeter VLBI, making use of the global millimeter VLBI array, also with the, with the VLBA, and, with, and especially also with Radio Astron, that is one of the antennas that it, it provides uh, baselines, including also antennas in the space. But Jose Luis is not only making fantastic and incredible images with the highest angular resolution, he's also very well known in, and has a very well known reputation because of the interpretation of the results that he is getting al along the years. In fact, I would say that uh, he's combining the observations together with uh, magnetic hydrodynamic codes just to, for the interpretation of the results, combining them also with emission codes. Today, I am sure that we are going to enjoy one fantastic seminar in which incredible results, the results of the black hole at, the, at our galactic center, that together with the results that were already published three years ago of the black hole at the center of M87, have provided a fantastic view of the physics of black holes, yes, uh, confirming what Einstein predicted all more than 100 years ago. Jose Luis, it's a pleasure for me to give you the word. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much, Anton, for this uh, beautiful uh, introduction. Well, for me, it's really a pleasure to be here. You know, three years ago, uh, we were in this uh, room and uh, we were showing to you the first image uh, of a black hole ever taken uh, by humanity. And that was on the, on the galactic center, uh, on the black hole at the galactic center of the galaxy M87. And uh, last week on Thursday, uh, we presented uh, the first image of the black hole in our galactic center. So for me, this is a really a special uh, occasion to, to share with, the, with all of you how we actually made that image and, and the long journey until we finally <coughs> publish uh, these results. Uh, this is going to be a special seminar because uh, it's going to be given by the group at the, uh, not only one person, but the full group of the EHT collaboration here at the Instituto of Astrophysica Andalucía. And then we will have a presentation from uh, Wang Yao uh, Zhao, from Sala Chayanu, from Ili Cho, and Antonio Fuentes, who is going to tell us uh, uh, how we actually uh, made this possible. So uh, uh, let me then start uh, uh, with the the, the animation that we showed uh, during the presentation in ESO uh, to show uh, the first image uh, of the black hole at the galactic center. So if we, if you, we sit uh, in the Atacama Terset uh, in, in, um, in Chile, and if this works, which it doesn't seem to be working. Sorry, I cannot pass these slides. Something is wrong. Yeah. Okay, no, perfect. All right, so this is an animation to, that shows that uh, we are zooming in into the, into the galactic center. And of course, uh, as you know, in the galactic center, uh, we have a lot of dust and, and material that is obscuring the, the center. So we need to observe this in, in infrared. 
And this is a, a continuous zoom in from the observations are taken with optical infrared telescopes. And when we get closer and closer to the center of our galaxy, then finally, for the first time, we have been able to see a, the giant lacking at the center of our galaxy, the image of the actual black hole that we have in the galactic center. So it was really a pleasure to see that after all these uh, years of hard work, we finally obtained the image. And uh, it was, of course, uh, scientifically very rele relevant, but it also captured the, the, the imagination of the general public. And here you can see uh, on the left, uh, these are, this is a collection of the covers of uh, the different uh, newspapers <laughs> around the world. And that was really uh, a special occasion in April 10, where you can see that the, the image of the black hole made it to the cover of the most relevant journals and also <clears throat> in the news, uh, in TV and radio across the globe. And this is a collection of the, of the same similar collection of the covers in this case for the image of the black hole and our galactic center. As you can see here, it was also very well covered by, by the press and it also made highlights because of course, this is the second image, but this is the black hole in our galactic center. It's our own black hole. And for the first time, we have the proof that it's a compact object that actually is a black hole as we will see in a minute. So uh, on, to, on May 12th, we published a, a special issue in, in the Journal of Statistical Journal Letters. And this is a, a screen capture of, uh, of the presentation of this special issue in which, as you can see, we published uh, six papers uh, associated with the uh, first results of the EHT uh, of the Galactic Center. It, uh, there is a, a, a first paper with a summary, then one paper uh, displaying the observation, multi-weight recovery. Then to our beloved uh, paper three, which actually shows the images. Then in paper four, uh, we do an analysis uh, of the interferometric data to determine with a high accuracy what is the actual uh, size of the ring. <coughs> in paper five, we give a theoretical interpretation comparing uh, the, uh, the observations with the relativistic MHD simulations. And in paper six, uh, we comment on the, on the relevance for, for, for our understanding of gravity and how these uh, fits into general relativity. Uh, these six papers were also accompanied by uh, four extra papers. And actually, three of them are focused on the fact that the side A is a highly variable source with changes in the time scales of minutes, as we will see in a minute. And this was actually what drove us completely crazy. Uh, so many people ask, why, you know, Aim at the seven first, and then and then Sajay, why took you years after you published Aim at the seven to publish the the image of uh, of Sajay star, and and the reason was because it's highly variable, and then we have to develop completely new algorithms, and actually, as I said, we are publishing two big accompanying papers just to uh, to explain how we actually uh, deal uh, dealt with the with the variability. Uh, so as we always like to say, uh, this is a big international effort. And in, in the case, uh, we, we love to say that you know, science is a collaborative thing, especially nowadays where we have this you know, difficult international situations uh, with a war in, 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 in four steps of, of Europe. But in the case of the EHT, this is basically a necessity because we have used uh, our telescopes spread around the world. So we do uh, need to, to have this really huge collaboration. And, and it's, it's also a great pleasure because you meet really fascinating people, completely different cultures, but with the same goal, you know, the same enthusiasm and, and, and the same vision of, of making the first images. And as we will see in the future uh, and later on and to make the first movies of Black Hole. So this is a big, big collaboration with more than 300 people. This is the last, uh, sorry, this, uh, that, that was the last um, collaboration meeting. In, in Hilo that we had in person. But um, today, what I would like to stress is the relevance of the group at the Instituto of Astrophysical Andalucía in Granada, Spain. And this is a, a, a this is a, a, a collection of pictures from, from, from the group. And uh, just briefly to comment uh, that uh, we have uh, Rocco Lico, who was uh, one of the of the colleagues uh, uh, of the uh, of the um, uh, game transfer from calibrator to Sajay, which was really essential 
Uh, Juan Yao Sao, who is uh, one of the coordinators of, uh, of the image uh, of the scattering working group in the collaboration. Uh, Saleh Kainur, who, uh, who, has, uh, who is a member of the Junior Science Council of the collaboration uh, and has been also very active in clean imaging. And uh, Ildi Cho, which is uh, our imaging guru, he, he knows everything about imaging. He can do imaging with many different techniques. Of course, Anchon Alberdi, who also participated in clean imaging, and our movie maker. This is uh, Antonio Fuentes. We have, uh, uh, as you will see, he will show the first attempt uh, to make movies out of Sajay, and he is our expert uh, about making movies of black holes. And the new acquisition, the new members of the team, uh, Teresa Toscano, who is just recently joined the collaboration, and our future, you know, promises, uh, Rohan Dahale and uh, Mariana Kosky. Uh, I'd like to stress that this was a very big effort. But I think we should be really proud of the work of the group at NIAA. It's one of the most relevant groups in Europe, and I would say in, in the whole collaboration. And, uh, and let me show you here uh, just some why, uh, with, uh, what was uh, our, our main contribution to, to this paper. As you can see, this is a, a screenshot of paper three. This, this is the, their paper. This is the paper with the image. This is what everybody was expecting. This is what everybody has seen. This is what uh, you know, drove us crazy to get this image. This is, a, this is the first step. Then all the theoretical interpretation comes after this. But this is the image. This is the paper. This is paper three. And uh, we had a really very, very relevant contribution to this paper. As you can see here, there are for each one of the papers, as I mentioned before, we have coordinators for these papers in the collaboration. In paper three, I was, uh, I was honored to be one of the coordinators as, a, as also as a, one of the imaging working group coordinators of the EHT, together with Katie Bowman that you may remember, she made you know, headlines when we showed the image of, uh, of M87. She's one of the other coordinators of the paper in the imaging working group. She's now in Caltech. And the third coordinator is uh, Kazuo Akiyama, who is in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So we coordinated the, the, this paper and uh, our group in the, at the Institute of Astrophysical Technology had a really huge contribution on this. The images that you have seen, and if you go into the paper, you will notice that we have used four different imaging pipelines as described here. Clean, which is a classical uh, method for interferometric imaging, EHT and the SMILE to RML method and things. Clean was developed here. The algorithm was developed here and was run fully here. So one third of all the images were run in, were run in the house and developed in the house, embedded in the house. EHT is the other powerful method. It was supervised by Katie, but all the parameter surveys, all the images, millions, and I'm talking about millions of images performed in a Google super, uh, supercomputer, Google Cloud, were performed by here, by our movie maker and uh, Antonio Fuentes. Smiley, we have two experts of Smiley here, uh, Wang Yao Zhao and, uh, uh, and, 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 and uh, Kotaro uh, Moniyama. It was supervised by, by Kasu, but uh, uh, Wang Yao is one of the coordinators of the Smiley uh, uh, working group. So he had also a very important contribution in the Smiley images. And then we have a four pipeline, a full variation method, uh, Themis, which is we did not touch this. This was fully developed uh, by the Perimeter Institute in Canada. So as you can see here, the relevance of the image of the first black hole in our Latin center was basically, you know, half of it made at, in the house, as happened also with M87. In M87, we used three of these pipelines and uh, we did the whole thing of clean here in the house. Not only this, one important aspect was the calibration of the gains. This is very relevant. And for this, we had to first image all the calibrators of Sajay and uh, Rocco, who is uh, joining us uh, uh, online. I'm, I'm sorry he couldn't be here today with us. Uh, uh, and Rocco was actually the need of the gain transfer from calibrator to Sajay, which was really driving us crazy because variability was tangled with, with gains. So we need to get a very good constraint of the gains. Otherwise, we could not constrain the variability. And, and Rocco was uh, one of these leaders. As you will see, scattering is very important. 
Uh, this is not affecting the Mediterranean, segment, but the Galactic Center is right at the Galactic Center, and, and it's well known for more than 50 years that uh, there is scattering, the, especially, you know, at, at long wavelengths, but it's also affecting 1.3 millimeter. And Wang Yao is one of the coordinators of the scattering working group. So he did all the work here. Without this, we could not have had an image of the satellite. Dynamical imaging, we have, we have not made a lot of noise about the, the first attempts to make movies, but you will see our attempts. And this was completely done by Antonio Fuentes. You will go to paper three, this is a full section, which is for, uh, section nine. Antonio did all the analysis of dynamical imaging. And of course, we participated, as we mentioned, clean uh, from the contribution from EOJ, from Thalia, and from Anchon. So I'm sorry that it sounds a little bit like, you know, you are, you know, selling yourself too much, but I think we should be proud of this. And, and, and I want to share how proud I am of these people. These are our, you know, these are our, 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 our geniuses. These are the, the people that made this possible. And thanks to the support of the Instituto de Estatística de Andalucía, they, they have been able to make this significant contribution to the subject. Okay, so, uh, okay, I think, okay, that was it. So, uh, and now uh, we will have the presentation from the different people in the group to explain how we actually managed to get uh, the, the image of the black hole. And the next speaker is, uh, is Rocco. Rocco, are you online? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, great. Thanks, Jose. So it's really a pleasure to be here today. Thank you all for being with us, for sharing uh, these results. And let me say that I'm also extremely proud for being part of the IAA team. This is really the best thing I've ever done in my career so far. So thank you so much, really proud. So, uh, and I'm sorry for not being there uh, because of the COVID, I had to stay home. So uh, let me go straight to the point and start with the story. For being able to take the image that uh, Jose Luis uh, just showed, um, we use the so-called very long baseline interferometry technique, which combines uh, the signal from several telescopes spread around the globe and allowing us to simulate a telescope which is as big as the Earth. So what you see here, so what an interferometer measure is just a set of complex visibilities, which sample the Fourier components of an image. And in the middle panel, the so-called UV coverage, what you see here, this is just the projected distance across the several antennas called baselines as seen from the source. And as the Earth rotates, you know, we feel more and more this plane, which is essential for then being able to reconstruct the image. And you will hear many more details about this uh, from my colleagues in, in the, during this talk. Next slide, please, Jose. All right, so in the specific case of uh, Sagittarius A star, we observed the source with this array of eight telescopes spread through the world. You see from Hawaii, Mexico, Arizona, Spain, Chile, and South Pole. And we observed at 1.3 millimeters in 2017 for five days in particular, uh, April 5, 6, 7, 10, and 11. By taking into account several things, like the days where ALMA did not observe, ALMA is the most sensitive antenna of the array, and by taking into account that there was an X-ray flare during April 11, it turned out in the end that the day with the best data quality is April 7, which is also the day where uh, the IRAM 30 meter station uh, from Sierra Nevada observed. And this provides us with the best UV coverage, as you see in the right panel here to the bottom uh, left. This is also the longest observation duration. This is the observation with the largest number of detection. And this is why we select this April 7 data set as our primary data set. And indeed the image that I showed uh, before, that was the image from this specific data set from April 7. And then to the left, you see another UV coverage. This is from April 6, which is the second day with the best UV coverage. And we use this uh, data set as a secondary validation data set. Next slide, please. All right, so this is a um, brief animation to show how the whole process um, works. So we start uh, with a bunch of telescopes spread around the globe uh, observing um, a source. Each, of these, each one of these telescopes is equipped with an atomic clock and is sampling analog signals, which are then converted into digital signals. These uh, data are then stored into our drives and then they are shipped to the calibration centers where we have supercomputers doing the so-called correlation of the data. And then after this process, we have the a priori calibration, 
when we put the when we align the faces of all the different telescopes and we correct the amplitudes and then through uh, several algorithms we will be able to reconstruct a fine actual image this is how the whole process works and just to give you an idea about the amount of data we start from petabyte of data with the raw data from the telescope until we reach the very last step of the actual image which is a really few kilobytes this is just a, an amazing thing next slide please Jose. All right, for Sagittarius A star, as Jose mentioned, we need uh, we needed really special care because mainly because of the uh, variability on very short time scales. This is something that will be also discussed in from my colleague in the next slides. And for this reason, uh, to calibrate the telescopes through the so-called antenna gains, we had to use uh, two calibrators, two calibration sources, which are J1924 and, and RAW530 which are, you know, if you go to the next slides, please Jose, uh, which are sources with a very simple structure, uh, very bright. Here, I'm showing uh, three millimeter GMV plus ALMA images of the two calibrators and not the actual EHT images, because these results are still um, under embargo and we are still working on that, but they are going to be published very soon. So uh, stay tuned for that. And by using the sources which, uh, whose structure is uh, stable uh, along, uh, across the observation and also the flux density is stable, we managed to characterize the time variable uh, antenna gains, as you see in the right plot with the two colors representing the two calibrators. And uh, each frame here represents a single antenna and each value is not a single value, but is the result as uh, it was mentioned earlier by Jose of multiple images because for each calibrator, we have multiple calibration pipelines, we have multiple imaging algorithms, and then we have multiple people making the images. So this was this is the outcome of a huge result that took several months. And in the end, with that, we were able to interpolate these uh, final gains to the Sagittarius A star timestamps, and then we transfer this to Sagittarius A star. And at this point, we are able to disentangle the intrinsic variability from the, of the source of Sagittarius A star from the fluctuations due to instrumentational effects. So next slide, please, Jose. And uh, this is the very last slide of my talk here. So during the EHT observations, there also was a multi-wavelength uh, campaign. And you see here, there were different facilities, both ground array and space, um, and, and space satellites, space observatories. For instance, you see here from the list uh, with the different colors, we have some uh, East uh, Asian DLBI network observations. This obs these results actually were very recently published by Ilje Cho, one of my colleagues. Please take a look at this paper, it's very nice results. And then we have other facilities like VLT, GMVA, as well as uh, satellites, SWIFT, Chandra, and NUSTAR. Let me say that this was really essential, having these constraints on the multi-wavelength uh, light curves and variability for getting constraints on theoretical model selection as well as the physical interpretation. And you will see how this uh, information were used in the next talk. Uh, I think this is my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, now we go to the next speaker, which is Wen Yao Zhao. He is going to talk about uh, what's happening and all that beautiful stuff. <coughs> Okay. Uh, here. okay. Yeah. So as I mentioned, we actually we've been asked uh, a few times why it took so long. It isn't this source much closer than the previous uh, black hole, and uh, the, the apparent size is actually slightly larger. But shouldn't uh, shouldn't take uh, shouldn't it be easier? But unfortunately, for imaging this particular source, we face uh, we face two unique challenges. The first one comes from the fact that we are in the same galaxy. We, to see the galactic center, we need to look through the inner galactic disk. Um, but there are many things on the way. As a matter of fact, at optical wavelengths, we cannot really see the galactic center because of the distinction. While at radio wavelengths, it is uh, uh, turbulent ionized plasma that will uh, scatter and distort the uh, our, our images. And uh, actually the scattering along the line of sight towards the galactic center is particularly strong. Although 
currently we know that the, most of the, the scattering actually didn't happen in the central area, but rather somewhere halfway between the, the center and us. So, uh, okay, how exactly this will affect our images? In the regime of strong scattering, there are two distinct uh, effects uh, on the image. The first one comes from uh, diffraction. Uh, which arises from small scale turbulences um, uh, in, in the plasma. <coughs> the time scale for this to smooth out is also quite short. So, in a typical VRBI position, we see the smooth effect of the diffraction, which is similar as a blurring of the image. And this is rather stable over time, and it's, it is well determined. But the, there is a secondary effect, which arises from larger scale uh, turbulence. Which will take more time to uh, longer than the typical VR observation to smooth out, which is a uh, refractive effect. These effects uh, further distorts the image. It's really similar as seeing through the hot gas following uh, uh, a jet. But uh, so these effects compare uh, in, in contrary to the previous one is rather stochastic. It's uh, uh, also difficult to. Uh, to, to handle. So, and how this affects our exact uh, observing data. So, if the source is not scattered, uh, we will see uh, the, the amplitude like shown, uh, shown here. Yeah. But the blurring kind of actually redistributes the, the, the flux in a slightly larger area. So, it kind of drops down the, the amplitude uh, and also the signal to noise ratio. At the especially longer wavelengths. But on top of this, the refractive effects further modulate the data. Okay, because th th this uh, change will also take longer time to average out. So at a single VRB observation, we see a random realization of these uh, uh, refractive effects. So, how exactly we can handle the, the data which is uh, scattered? For the blurring, as it's well determined, we can simply use a method which is called de-blur. But the tricky one is the refractive one, which is uh, uh, more stochastic. And it, deter it, it depends on the intrinsic source structure. It also depends on the actual magnetic field configuration in the uh, scattering material. So what we did is we run, use the existing tools, we run lots of simulations using several uh, up to eight, uh, seven geometric models, we uh, image many random uh, realizations of the, the scattering and take the uh, standard deviation of them to uh, get the level of the refractive effects. And we treat it as noise so that we increase the error budget of the actual data. And after this, uh, we would say the, <coughs> the chi squares we get will be more reasonable, like uh, uh, around uh, one here. OK. So another effect comes from the time variability, I think, as Jose and uh, Rocco uh, already mentioned. Compared with uh, MET7, although the two black holes have quite comparable angular size, but in the actual linear scale, set star is more than like 1,500 times smaller. So although the material around the, near the event horizon moves at the speed of light, uh, near the speed of light in, in, in each case, but for a black hole as large as the uh, MT7, it takes several days to make a full circle, while in Sagistar, uh, th this happens in several minutes. And this breaks one of the basic assumptions for VLBI imaging. As Rocco mentioned, we, we need to wait when the Earth rotates to sample in the Fourier space. But but if the source is changing, it, it feels like we have set up a long exposure to take a photo of a puppy, but it's keep chasing its tail in the same time. So how are we going to do this? Again, we try to characterize the variability. And apparently, most of the, the largest contribution comes from the overall flux, uh, the, the brightness change. And uh, so uh, since one of the uh, two, two of the uh, elements like ARMA and SMA have measured the total uh, the light curve uh, quite well, so we can normalize the flux. After this, we take out the largest contribution of the variability, and the rest of them can be well described 
by a uh, uh, broken power law as, as shown here and uh, on the right side plot. And, as, as a matter of fact, the variability actually uh, exceeds the level of refractive noise by an order of magnitude. So and again, we treat this as noise and add this as additional error budget to the data. So it is fine for the data to be imaged as a static source. And now you're going to talk about how we actually build up the imaging pipeline and how we uh, test and uh, validate the results. Yeah, thanks a lot, Gongyao. Uh, yes, now I'm going to briefly introduce the basic process of the BAVI imaging. Uh, so first, if we if we have uh, the perfect telescope, which is the size of the Earth, then there is the imaging, just getting the image of this, uh, this small black hole would be much easier. Uh, but that is not realistic since we have just a number of telescopes which is spread all over the world and there are still a lot of holes between the telescopes. So that makes uh, this kind of fundamental problem, which is so-called the ill post. Uh, so always the number of the pixels of the image we have to obtain is larger than the number of points of we have in the data. So um, it is difficult to get the unique solution from our observed data. Uh, so uh, unless we have uh, the enough number of uh, the information. So for instance, uh, if we observe this kind of cute puppy in the universe with kind of the similar observation with our DABI system, then there is still a possibility to get the similar images, which is still not a puppy or something like that. So we need to be really careful uh, to analyze our uh, observed data to get the correct image. So to convince ourselves and get the right image of the dirt source, uh, we first uh, used uh, different uh, imaging softwares, uh, which approaches different ways. So the first one is so-called deconvolved method, deconvolved, deconvolution method. And uh, one of the representative uh, the method is so-called clean. And this is based on the assumed assumption of the image, uh, which is uh, which cons consists of a number of point sources. And um, this is most conventional uh, way of the imaging of the BABI uh, data. And we are now using uh, the software named DeepMap. And especially all of our IAEA members uh, participated in the imaging and just um, the lead led uh, of the development of the DeepMap pipeline. Um, together. And also, um, there is another um, the way of the imaging, so-called regularized maximum likelihood. And this approach is a little different with uh, deconvolution method. While deconvolution method starts from the inverse Fourier transform, uh, this regularized uh, maximum likelihood starts from the uh, visibility data, so-called forward modeling. So first, we fit the, uh, the model to the data and find the best model which fits the uh, data uh, very well. Um, so for this method, we are now using two uh, representative uh, softwares named Smiley and EHT Imaging Library. And, and from IAA, we also participated in uh, these two uh, imaging methods. Um, also, just Antonio and Guangyao led uh, the part of the imaging uh, pipeline development and also the coordination of the imaging. And another one is, as Jose uh, introduced, uh, there is full Bayesian approach, which is new for this Sagittarius imaging compared to the M87, uh, which is uh, mostly developed uh, by the Parameter Institute. Um, this is uh, completely different with the other uh, the methods as well. So uh, we can independently uh, make sure our the results from uh, this method as well, together with the other methods. And for this, uh, method we used uh, the software uh, named Themis. So um, as Guangyao also introduced briefly, uh, before going into our real uh, data set, we first convinced ourselves of this imaging method and software together with uh, the synthetic data. So first we generated uh, seven different kinds of the geometric models, which has the different shape like from the crescent ring to double source or just point light source. And then edit uh, the similar noise with the real Sagittarius star data to, uh, of the variability and the scattering. And then as a result, we have this kind of 
the synthetic image, synthetic movies actually, which resembles the real Sagittarius A star data. So uh, for all these uh, synthetic models, we did uh, the imaging with different pipelines and different different softwares, uh, which consists of tens of millions of uh, the parameter combinations. So based on this, a uh, lot of images, we selected the top set parameters, which is successfully reconstruct all these images uh, across all different uh, imaging softwares. Uh, this shows the, Im uh, the results of the reconstructed images for different geometric models. And as you can see, uh, even with this single same imaging parameter for each uh, imaging software, uh, that reconstructs uh, all different shape of the geometric models. So based on these top set parameters, we applied the same parameter set to the GRMHD simulation, which more resemble the real uh, Sagittarius A star data. And then uh, these are showing uh, the result of the images of G this GRMHD simulation, which uh, which also quite similar with the uh, ground truth image. So after uh, after convince ourselves with this kind of full process, we move on to the site star data. So now Antonio Fuentes will introduce our real study star data result. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, so. Now that we uh, we have trained uh, our algorithms and the pipelines are ready for imaging uh, Sage Star, let's see what we got. So all these images, all these thousands of images that you see flying around here are possible appearances of Sage Star. So all, while all these images are slightly different, uh, all of them are consistent with the data and, and can represent the, the true sort of structure. So um, if we uh, average all these images uh, to <coughs> emphasize the, the common features, what we obtain is a bright uh, ring with a central uh, dark region. But if we take a deeper look at these, uh, at these thousand of images, we can see that we can uh, further uh, cluster them into uh, four different categories. So the vast majority of these images can be classified uh, uh, into three different, into these three first cluster that show ring-like structures. But also there is another another cluster which is really uh, very uh, much smaller in comparison with these three that also contain uh, images that doesn't look like uh, real life structures. But if, when we look at the average image of all these these the, all these thousand images, what we see is this uh, uh, bright uh, uh, ring of uh, of plasma that is uh, surrounded this central dark uh, area, which has a diameter uh, of exactly the same size as what was expected from uh, previous observations and theory. Um, so now you might be wondering why do we have uh, four different clusters of images for Sage Star and just one day when for MT7 we have this uh, just a single image for, for each day. So um, there, this is because of two main reasons. Uh, one first is, is because of the sparseness of the EHD array, which was introduced by, by my colleagues, and also because of the intrinsic source variability, which was also introduced by, by, by them. Um, so to get some intuition on, on what it's like to get uh, to capture a picture of of, uh, of Sage Star, so let me play another movie. Okay, so here we have placed a, a camera on the on the uh, Dolomite Mountains in Italy, and we are recording uh, the, the the scene uh, during during twelve hours, just as as we as uh, our observations. So if instead of this recording, what we take is uh, our snapshots of, of, the, of this uh, movie that we are seeing here. What we will see is that we can uh, also classify this snapshot uh, based on their appearance into four different clusters, just as we did with uh, Sage Star. So now we are forming these clusters <coughs> based on, on the, the different type of clouds, weather, and so on. This is just an analogy of what would we like to image to uh, Sage Star, but it's not actually the same. Actually, Sage Star uh, will be the mountain, the mountain will be moving itself as well as, uh, as the clouds surrounding it. Uh, so, yeah, so we can uh, get these four different uh, cluster of images, but we can also get the average image of the Dolomite Mountains during these 12 hours uh, observations. But what if uh, we try not only to get an average image of, of, the, of Sage Star, but also reconstruct the dynamics that we that we know uh, that they, they are present in, in, in the black hole. 
So um, we tried that. We, we did the first attempt of movie reconstruction, says it of CG Star. Uh, we got some results. I will show you this uh, now. Uh, but the, the, let me first introduce a few concepts. So, as, as my colleague said, uh, the EXT coverage is sparse, which makes uh, reconstructing an image a difficult task. But if we, instead of just taking the full length of the observation, we just take chunks of data of one to two minutes length, then the, the, EXT, coverage is, the EXT coverage is even more sparse. And reconstructing a, a reasonable image is just not possible. So in order to overcome this issue, we developed methods that uh, impose strong priors on the, on, the, on the source structure and can actually uh, reconstruct movies of, the, of, the, of this very little information. Uh, we also focus on a, uh, on, on a, on a time window of uh, a bit less than two hours because this time window is the one uh, during the whole length of the observation that contains the best coverage and that allow us to reconstruct the, the dynamics of the source. But first, uh, let's uh, test uh, our methods uh, with uh, GRMXT simulations of CGS star to see if we are able to actually reconstruct the dynamics of, of a source for, for which we know what are the dynamics. So here we have on the top row uh, two GRMXT simulations, uh, which try to resemble uh, CGS star, which are also affected by scattering, as you see here. And these are the movie reconstruction that we got for, for, for these two simulations. Um, and here on the right, what I'm showing is a figure uh, that we have uh, used a lot in the, in the paper to quantify our ability to, to track the, the, uh, the, the true dynamics of the, of the simulation. So what we see here, these are three snapshots of the simulation. And here we see in red, the, what we see here is, is the position angle of the ring as a function of time. And here in red, we have this curve in red is the, the true position angle of the ring uh, during this, this uh, time window. And then in green and blue, we are seeing the densities uh, of uh, the, the histograms of the, of the reconstructed movies with, uh, with our methods. And, and we see how uh, this, uh, we are able with, um, within some uncertainty to actually reconstruct the, the, for this particular case, this, the, the, the true uh, dynamics of the, of the simulation. So now that we see that we that we know that we can um, reconstruct the, the dynamics of, of, of sources for which we know the, the, the true dynamics, let's see what we got for Sage star. Okay, so yeah, here I'm showing uh, the results for Sage Day star. So we have here two panels for April 6 uh, and two panels for April 7. So these, these two movies are, uh, were uh, made using uh, uh, something we call temporal, a different uh, level of temporal regularization, which is the amount uh, of uh, continuity that we allow from frame to frame when we do, frame rec when we do a movie reconstruction. So for April 6, if we allow uh, uh, less, uh, less, continuity, less continuity from frame to frame, and if we also allow more continuity from frame to frame, we see that we obtain mostly the same, uh, basically the same uh, movie, which is uh, uh, just um, uh, as a movie, which is mostly static and we have, uh, with, with, a, with a ring, which is uh, brighter in the upper right uh, side. On the contrary, on April 7, uh, when we allow less uh, continuity from frame to frame, we obtain this uh, interesting evolution uh, uh, during this time window in which these bright components move from this side to this side. But if we don't allow that much uh, flexibility, uh, then what we get is this mostly static uh, movie. So uh, with this uh, very little information that we have in, in the 2017 uh, observation, we cannot actually constrain uh, for April 7, uh, which one of these movies is better than the other and which one represents the, the, the actual uh, dynamics of the source. So our results are not conclusive, but this, uh, this first attempt set the, the path forward to get the first actual movies of, of black holes in, in the, for the next uh, observations of CGS star. We also uh, perform a geometric modeling of CGS star directly on the interplanetary visibility measured by, by the array. Um, so with this geometric modeling, what we found is that the, the a ring uh, is the best uh, geometric model that uh, the be that best fits the data. 
and with this uh, with this uh, ring we, we can uh, extract some properties and then get uh, an estimation of the of the of the diameter and so on so uh, using these these ring models that you see here which are characterized by this by the width diameter and position angle what we uh, what we obtain for safe star, safe star is that the the the, the ring is it has a diameter of 52 microseconds, a thickness of 30 to 50 percent of this diameter, a gravitational radius which is around five microseconds, and a black hole mass which is around four million times the, the mass of the sun. Um, yeah, so I think that's uh, from our side. So, so now Talia will tell us about uh, what we learned from the black hole. So, in order to interpret the effectiveness of the black holes that we observed at ESD, we performed uh, uh, geodermic disintegrations of the plasma surrounding the black hole. So, we assumed <clears throat> of a torus of ideal plasma uh, swirling around the black hole that uh, has some ideal properties. Sorry. Yes. And uh, we uh, we tried to um, uh, I'm sorry to uh, set a specific to test specific parameters of how the the uh, the system should look like in order to uh, uh, create the, the image that we obtain. So we check the inclination of the spin of the uh, uh, of the black hole. Uh, the, we check uh, we tested we explore the existence of spin and if the material around the black hole is swirling uh, together with uh, in the same direction with the spin of the black hole or in opposite retrograde or prograde or uh, the the type or in the exist the type of the accretion flow for instance if uh, um, if we have a uh, magnetically arrested disk where the, the magnetic fields are ordered and dominates the accretion flow or uh, or uh, uh, normal accretion, uh, normal uh, uh, type of accretion where the magnetic fields are scattered and um, uh, not interrupt the, the, the flow. So we evaluate these uh, models based on the it or the say the size of the image, the shape of the image. We simulated different spectra spectra mm -hmm. in a different. Um, wavelengths and the low frequency size of uh, uh, other images. So out of 1.8 million images that we um, we uh, created, we applying all these different constraints and criteria, we ended up with two, only two models surviving on, on this process. Here we can see the, uh, the best depth model that we obtain, and it's closer to the image that, uh, that the Secretary Safe Star image. So, uh, in these beautiful pie charts, we see a summary of what we have done in uh, exploring the, the, the theoretical and the plasma flow around the black hole. So, uh, we see here that. Uh, 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 how uh, which uh, uh, spin values we uh, we obtain, and uh, the type of accretion, the temperature of the electrons present with red color, uh, we designate the the models that fail in all uh, the all the constraints that we set, and uh, with uh, with green is the uh, the models that passed. Our, our, our criteria. So uh, we have two models, as I mentioned, which corresponds to a magnetically arrested type of accretion. Uh, the material around the black hole is moving uh, in the same uh, direction with the spin of the black hole, and the black hole is, is actually spinning. And uh, the inclination of the spin axis is uh, around 30 degrees with a, with a line of sight. And we have here the ratio of the uh, electron uh, temperature. So uh, in summary, we have, we created 
million images, 1.3 million SEDs that all corresponds to 50 terabytes of data. But besides the, the properties of the plasma around the black hole, we have also theoretical, the, the, we can test theories, different theories of, uh, for instance, gravity and general relativity. Since Einstein uh, published the, the, general, the theory of general relativity, we tried to test it and, uh, and uh, um, prove that it's not valid. So for this, we have developed, uh, we have developed different tests in different uh, regimes, gravitational regimes in our solar system, in cosmological uh, level, etc. But it still offer us, offer us to uh, test these theories in a very strong gravitational field, very close to the, uh, to the horizon of the black hole. So uh, it's particularly important the, the significance of these two images that we have obtained with EXT, because it's, we can direct test and rule out many of these theories. So in, uh, in this beautiful plot, we can see how, uh, how well the Sagittarius A star and M87 uh, uh, follow <coughs> the predictions of general relativity. So for these images, we saw that GR is still holds strong. And uh, especially because we know that uh, with very uh, uh, good accuracy, the mass of the Sagittarius A star which was uh, one of them, uh, was uh, the, the Nobel uh, awarded about this uh, estimation. Because we know so well the mass of the uh, Sagittarius C star black hole and uh, the distance, we can predict with very good, uh, we can test with very high accuracy the predictions of uh, general relativity. Uh, for M87 with less accuracy. And here we can see uh, also the predictions about the gravitational wave event that detected some years ago. So the beauty in this plot is that one of the uh, predictions of general relativity is that black holes, despite their different uh, environments or different sizes, are, can be described with uh, just three parameters, their mass, their spin, and their charge. So here we can see black holes of, that differs in eight orders of magnitudes that can be described <laughs> by the non hair theorem. And that, this is really beautiful. We can, yeah, we can see uh, that still uh, this theory works. And besides these predictions, we can learn a lot from the size of the ring. Here in this movie, we can see how well, uh, how the general relativity predicts the size of the black hole shadow. And uh, if it's uh, another alternative theory uh, is uh, valid, how much deviates. And here is the actual image that we captured and we see the predicted shadow with a ring, with a, uh, with a green ring and the actual measurement which is with a blue ring. Also, we tested some other uh, parameter, theoretical parameters as assuming that uh, uh, Sagittarius A star was a, 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 ref, a reflecting surface with albedo one and or some other albedos and we found that uh, 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 an object with reflecting reflecting surface with albedo 0.3, uh, it's uh, only marginally different than the real image that we obtained. And to conclude, today we are able not just to uh, imagine black holes, but to actually take pictures of them, and not only one, and several of them, and compare them. And here we can see. Uh, 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 how uh, the size of these two black holes and how different is each other. M87 is 1,500 times larger 
then, then uh, uh, Sagittarius star. And uh, we can see how, how much um, uh, 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 exotic and uh, or difficult to imagine is uh, these differences. However, we can uh, compare, test, and measure uh, uh, their properties and uh, conclude that can be described with the same way. And now, thank you. And now, uh, Jose is going to tell us about more about the future. Thank you very much, Fabian. OK, so we are, we are running out of time, but I really want to tell you what is next. OK, so we have two levels. So people say, hey, no. You know, this, this was actually the, the name of the issue to image this to the So we are wrong, but what is next? So this is just the beginning. We are running out of time, but I really want to show you just a few, few slides. To, to tell you what, uh, what, what is expecting for us. So uh, first of all, this is, uh, we are already working the next generation of the EHT, okay? So this is a very active project. And, uh, and, and this is a project which is actually funded by the NSF. We already have 12 millions for, for the design. It's gonna be, you know, 10 more dishes. So this is the timeline. We do expect that in a couple of years, we'll have the final review and start building in, in 24, uh, 2025, 2026, okay? So this is, this is really ongoing. So we are just getting started. So this is a, a new era in black hole imaging. We have already uh, uh, made uh, the science working groups uh, with uh, fundamental physics, black hole evolution, uh, and, and, and also even transients and so on. So this is a really on, ongoing effort internationally across the globe. And we are having here also a very significant participation leading one of the working groups uh, uh, together with uh, PJ Natarajan uh, from the from Princeton and, and Tali is also helping, helping a lot in this aspect. And we want to put uh, many different telescopes and these are possible sizes. And you would see here, this uh, CNI. This is not the Centro Nacional de Inteligencia, but this is the Canary Islands as uh, the Americans uh, think about it. And uh, we are really trying to put a, a telescope in the Canary Islands. So we are discussing this with the presidency of the CSIC and we are having this, we have discussed this with the Institute of Astrophysica de Canarias. And we are working very hard to try to get one antenna here because we know we have already put a real a radiometer in the Canary Islands, in the Terry Observatory, and this is a good site. This is actually one of the best sites that we are considering for the NGT. So this is gonna help. We are gonna have a telescope here. I, I don't know where we are gonna get the money from, hopefully from Spain, but otherwise the Americans are going to put their antenna there. So we are really, really pushing forward to having one of these antenna, which you know, main leading from Spain and leading from the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía. And, and as I said, this is almost uh, uh, certainly happening. Okay, so uh, the antenna, as I said, is, has been uh, um, uh, identified as one of the best sites for covering Sci J star and also uh, M87. So it's, it really provides excellent information. We are working very hard on this. And uh, these are the main goals that we have for the, for the NGHT. So you can see here the coverage and what we may expect with the NGHT. So we do want to make movies of M87, Sci J and test uh, gravity. We will very soon, relatively soon in the next year, show you the first movies of how uh, black holes are created. So we are going to learn how we can extract energy from these black holes. We are going to make movies also of uh, Sci-J. We are going to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to see a plasma moving around Sci-J. We you saw for Antonio the first movies. With 2022 data, we may be able to get the actual first ones. And then with HD, we will get explicit movies and we will see move, uh, material around, not just astronomy as you know, we are here to get us. We will see it, we will measure the spin of the black hole in the galactic center. So this is, as I said, just the beginning. And of course, we want to test GI. This is the most important thing. We, uh, the image that we see here is a combination of a different uh, astrophysics, which is what we call M0, and then different rings. N1, N2, which, uh, which are, these are the rings coming from the photons going around one, two, three times the black hole. These are the metric. So they actually prove the metric. This is, this is really, the, this will be the first time we will actually be able to, with very high precision, tell at which point we are made break down. And this is one of the main goals of the, EHT, of the NGEHT. And this is gonna happen in, in as, you, I, as I'm going to show you here. 
This is what we expect to get with the NGHT with two different frequencies. So we will see the beautiful M2 ring. This is where all DR is, in, is, is, is captured. And, uh, and we are leading this. The Instituto of Astrophysics Andalusia is hosting the first meeting of the EHT and NGHT collaborations in a month from now. So IAA is going to be in the center of black hole uh, studies in, in, in the world. And, and we, as I said, we are taking a very important leading role here. And uh, this is just a slide to summarize it, but uh, I'm not going to read it, but I, I hope that after all this talk, uh, we have convinced you that the, the amazing people we have here, these are the heroes, and they are really contributing significantly. And we are positioned in having a very strong contribution in the next decade. And just to, uh, to finalize, this is what I usually like to show. Uh, everybody here has seen the, the Interstellar movie, so this is science fiction. And now with each the science fiction has actually become a science fact. So stay tuned and thank you very really much for your attention. So now the, the talk is open for, for questions. Uh, for doing the question here in the room, we, we need to move the micro. So from one to there, I need uh, maybe the, the help of one of you to move the, the micro from the question to the answer. Sure. And I will manage, I will manage the, the question at the sure. Just approach the micro to the person that. Isabel. <clears throat> Great team, I'm really proud and congratulations. I already said so, but I think it's, uh, I mean, I, I, I think I'm sure that I can say that we all at the IAA share the proudness of being part of this and having you as colleagues. So um, that's a great challenge and, and, and you've done it. So congratulations. And, and I'd like to make a comment that I think that we are all at the IAA, we are all proud of that. And we should not forget that it is also true thanks to something we have uh, would make us special as well, which is as a little to our program. And two of the amazing people in your team are funded by us a little to our program, from which we are very proud as well, I'm, I'm sure. So th thanks so much for giving us the opportunity of knowing how the black hole of our own galaxy was 27,000 years ago. That's great. Yes, Thank you very much, Isabel. Thank you very much, Isabel. Of course, yes. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of, the, of my talk, uh, we, we do appreciate the support from the AEA as well as, of course, uh, other funding, funding agencies. But this is, this is what really makes us proud to, to carry the, the name of the IAA everywhere. And you have seen this in the past days, uh, how the IAA was you know, spelled out very clearly all around the world. So it's, it's for us really a, a big pleasure. Just to add that since you weren't here when you were you in, in Munich and, and the other the, the remaining team in Madrid, we were we shared the uh, the very special day here. We, we were many of us and we even clapped, even knowing that nobody was <laughs> listening to us on the, the, the other side. So we already had that you know, that great feeling of someone someone sharing the, that that incredible experience. <laughs> Thank you very much, Isabel. Yeah, Wagner, please. Yes, hello. Yes, hi. Well, first of all, congratulations to all of you. I mean, I this has been said many times, but fantastic work and great presentations. I have there's two things that have um, that I'm curious about. So, uh, two brief questions. The first one is when you do these when you categorize, when you classify the possible solutions into four different images, three of them are really extremely similar, Why one of them is quite different. Is there any correlation between the different imaging algorithms or do the four different imaging algorithms all produce the same statistical distribution of these four categories? That's question number one. And question number two, I'll, I'll say it directly because that may be also related, I'm not sure. So during Antonio's talk, I was surprised that when you look at the April 6th and April 7 movies or average images, I think that is the same in this case, the bright spot is on exactly opposing sides of such a star, which is something that is surprising giving both basically the face on orientation. And do you observe anything like this in the magnetohydrant, 
in the simulations? That would be a question to Talia, maybe. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, these are really great questions. I'm going to ask them the first one, and then Tony, and then perhaps Talia. So in, indeed, uh, you know, right now, one of, one of the main things that, uh, and this is why we, it took us so much time, was whether, you know, the, when we get at this, uh, not so ring like images, whether they are produced by a particular pipeline or a particular set of parameters, a particular prescription of variability, a particular prescription of a scattering, or even the gains. I mean, so everything was playing around. It was it was really crazy. And, uh, and indeed, what we found is that this is not associated with any particular pipeline. It's not okay. associated with any particular prescription. It's just like the, a combination of the variability and the part and, and the UV and the sparse UV coverage. So it's it's it's, it's not something that we could uh, have identified. Otherwise, we may have identified this, and then so we will say, okay, we can rule out that these uh, these uh, non-wing images. So we we did work for for literally for years, uh, Raina, to, to 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 try to get an answer to that question. Uh, and let okay, me pass okay. it on now to uh, to Antonio for the for the moment. Uh, thank you, Raina. So yeah, um, it's uh, actually yeah, it's to what you what you say. So for every six, we have the bright spot on one side, and for every seven, we have on the other. Even if we don't see any any evolution uh, during uh, you know uh, the time window, and that's that's actually surprising. But it's uh, something that we should be also careful uh, when we interpret these results because, um, as I said, the, with little information that we have during this time window, which is actually the best region of the whole observation where we can uh, attempt to reconstruct the dynamics, but still, it's it's a bit of too little information to actually. Uh, constrain whether this is this this um, uh, change in, in the orientation of the of the position angle is is uh, is true um, because also we we have we have seen that when we change some of the parameters that we use in the in the in the dynamic imaging methods we don't always get the same position angle so we I mean this is um, very interesting of course including the evolution that we see in some of the movies in 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 April on April seven. But still, uh, let's let's uh, be careful with the with interpretation and wait until the next uh, observation where we will have more more telescopes added to the to the array and we will uh, we will be able to constrain more the the dynamics of say stuff. Great, thank, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And I don't not I do not want to be overcritical or anything. I mean, this is fantastic work. I just was curious. Okay, thanks. Please uh, repeat the question about the simulations. Yeah, I think yeah. I think finally, yeah, the question was whether we do something like that in the simulations. So, uh, yeah, actually, the, the brightness that we see in the simulations, I think we should be careful. <laughs> And uh, what we see about the brightness in the simulations, we should be careful because it is based on many assumptions and uh, has not some um, a direct impact in the uh, in the image. So we tested some uh, fundamental fundamental properties and not the actual um, uh, where the, the bright patches should be. If I may comment, yeah. just, just a final comment. Actually, uh, Raina, yesterday, was yesterday, yes, I got a. An email from from Nature and one of the writers that they are writing an article about the results here, and they were asking me. Uh, so it seems that in your simulation, the, the, the material is rotating counterclockwise, while VLTI showed that it seems to be rotating clockwise. So is this this in the in disagreement? So are you getting this um, uh, disagreement with VLTI? And and the answer is no, because actually. The, we don't see a jet in inside JSTAR, which is what uh, allow us in MT7 to constrain the spin. So we do, we we don't know uh, what may be the, the spin, whether pointing towards us or away from us in inside JSTAR. So all we can say is that uh, it's most probably rotating very fast and, and it's, it has a pro grade accretion on this, but we cannot say we cannot constrain with the, the with the data we had in 2017 whether it's a uh, rotating clockwise or, or anti-clockwise. And this is why what um, Thalia was mentioning. So we, we cannot say whether you know it's one side or the other, the, the one who should be brighter uh, the, 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 due to the to the Doppler boosting. So I hope I hope this answers your question, Ryan. Yeah, thank you. 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 Thank you
Yes, I think so, roughly. Um, well, we can discuss about that anyway. I mean, I, there's nothing major in mind. It's just some curious comments that I have. Thanks. Thanks a lot. There's a question Yeah, yeah, that, that. Yeah, that's indeed an, an, an excellent question. Yes, with the with the comparison with the GRM and the simulations, we have constrained the creation rate, which is very small as we inspected. It's really, I we we use, uh, we like to 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 uh, to, um, to comment about the, the uh, an analogy. I mean, if uh, if we translate the mass of uh, of SIG to a person, so we can ask uh, how much a person would eat would eat. And the, and the answer is that if the person would eat one grain of, uh, of rice every one million year. So this is this is a creation rate of Sajé. So it's, it's really completely quiet and quiescent. Uh, of course, completely different environments than the M87, which is, you know, a, 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 a higher creation rate and, you know, a huge luminosity. And this is why we see this amazing jet that we see in M87 and we don't see it in, in Sajé. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Congratulations for for the results um, and for the fantastic work, guys. Yeah, um, I am, I also have a, a a curiosity. Actually, I think it's a very similar question to the one to one of those made by Reiner, and it's that you know this because of this strong variability of the source. You said that within minutes the, the source is changing. Uh, you, you couldn't do the same, you know, you couldn't obtain the same result as for M87, that's the reason it took so long. But still, when I see the image and I see these three bright spots, it would then, it would, it would appear that there is something there. So, because if it is just variable within minutes, why shouldn't be basically a smooth, you know, all the old, just a, a, a green with a, an average profile of similar flux density. So is, is this a still, do, do you think it's an artifact or, this will be solved. Is this maybe something real here in those in those three bright spots? That's the, the, the first question. And then the second question I have is: um, uh, how, Is there any limit to, to the to the um, to the technique in the sense that because you have the the, the spin of the the, well, the axis of the black hole, maybe if it is not uh, let's say well oriented, you wouldn't have measured. In the case you have, we have a jet or something that may hint to 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 the spin. Is there any limit in the applicability of this technique to, to measure other black holes, supermassive black holes? Thanks, okay. thanks a lot. Hello, Miguel. Uh, okay, let, let me answer the first question, then I may have to, to, to ask you to, to rephrase a bit, a bit the second because I couldn't hear you very well. Okay, so for the first one, uh, yes, uh, we, we do see these uh, this, uh, three main dots that you are seeing now in the image. But uh, we think this is mainly also related to the UV coverage. We, we don't think these are uh, real artifacts. And in fact, uh, in different, uh, in different with di slightly different parameters, and, and, and uh, we see a, a slight change in the brightness distribution around the ring. So we, the, we cannot provide the same constraints on the brightness distribution around the ring as we need for M87. So we should just consider that uh, the most relevant here is that all of these images, and this is really amazing, all of them, even though they have different uh, distribution of the, of the emission around the ring, all of them have 52 microseconds. And this is exactly, exactly what it was expected from 4 million mass black hole. So we have the Nobel Prize, it should be 4 million, and now we say, uh, which was, you know, for, saying that, that there was a very compact object with 4 million solar masses. And, and the image showed that this is a black hole. And, and, and this is the most relevant part. Whether you know, the, 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 the emission is bright in one side or the other, we cannot tell with this observation. We do expect it to be able to tell this. And actually, 
it, we do expect to get the movies uh, of, of Saje with uh, hopefully with 2022 data, which was really excellent, and three more antennas, and uh, of course in the, with the future NGEHT. Uh, and then the second question, can can you repeat it? Uh, I, I, sorry, there was some some noise here, and I couldn't I couldn't yeah. hear it. Okay, so actually, well, also to clarify, I mean that that's fantastic. I also understood that these fifty two microseconds do not depend on this, but it is it was my my understanding that also the position and how this bright stuff is is um, is distributed carries a lot of very useful information. So that was my question, not a criticism, but actually, you know, if we, I understand this may not be real after all, or you know, UV coverage and things uh, will be improved. But that, uh, I mean, please do not take me this as a criticism. It's just oh, that maybe, maybe there was something here that you can already uh, say and not. But okay, that you 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 answer this question. So the other one is, may, I mean, maybe I'm saying something is stupid, but is that okay? Because you have the spin of the uh, black hole that maybe you, you I mean, maybe you don't know about maybe a priori, and here in this case because there is no obvious jet from from the source. Uh, if you have other supermassive black holes where the situation is similar, to which extent you are limited, or maybe not, by the te by this technique, in the sense that maybe you need to have this face on or somehow you know some kind of orientation. Is it uh, is it relevant the, the orientation of the of the spin uh, of the spin axis of the supermassive black hole or not to actually continue you know doing a kind of a statistics of these uh, measurements for other supermassive black holes. It, yeah, it, yeah, that's an excellent question, uh, Miguel. Of course, I mean, uh, uh, the this, this spin of the black hole will change the circularity and the size of the ring. So if we are able to, uh, to, to measure, especially, you know, the N1 and N2 rings, we should be able to really determine what is the spin of the black hole. There is uh, some degeneracy uh, in the sense also, if you see the, the black hole uh, uh, completely, you know, from uh, face on, uh, then the spin actually does not change it that matter the, the shape. But if it is uh, edge on, you will see as in, uh, about 5% change in the circularity and the size of the ring associated with the spin. So this is actually one of the main goals that we would like to, uh, to, to, um, to study with the next generation EHT. We do want to, to measure the, the, uh, the shape of the N1 ring and from there to get a, a very uh, accurate estimation of the spin, which carries us a lot of information. Though, you know, we will want to study you know, one of the working groups of the, actually the one I'm, I'm co-chairing with, uh, with Priya is, is to study the evolution of black holes uh, in, in the universe. And, uh, and, uh, and in order to, to check how these black holes merges, uh, having the information of the spin is essential because the spin ca carries the information of the previous mergers. So this is a, a especially interesting, to, you know, science uh, aspect in for our for ourselves. Okay, thanks a lot, and congratulations again to the whole team. Great job, carry on. Hello, Miguel. We wish we wish you were you were here to to share this with. Oops. Curiosity with respect to the the spin of the black do you have any other explanation in general relativity that you expect to be able to, 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 to use and handle when you will have the new data with the, with the I mean, is or just in, in, in the comparing things? Or are you, I mean, do you have any, any other alternative that you can test? Yes, and, I, and actually, the full paper sequence on that uh, is a lot, I think. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a beautiful paper, and of course there are many black hole mimickers. So they are uh, boson stars and and, see, and naked singularities and and other you know solutions or deviation from from GR. And this is exactly what we want to test. Uh, what we are measuring now here is that the N zero ring, which carries information about the size of the black hole. But is is we need to observe also N one ring to get at what is the actual shape of the. Of the of the of the event horizon, which holds information of, of whether actually GR is 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 right or there are some deviation from GR. This is where you know this is the strongest regime for for GR in, in the strong field regime. There is nothing stronger than that that we can observe. So if GR breaks down, it's going to be there, and this is what we really want to measure. For instance, one of the the most beautiful things that. Uh, I saw I, I, that we have in paper four, and that one, this is Ramesh and Arayan from CFA who, who wrote that section, is whether there is a surface uh, on, on this black hole. And you know, there are some mimickers 
and uh, I don't know if Carlos is here, Carlos Barcelos, if you, we, have, we have had some beautiful chats about this. So one of the possibilities, and actually LIGO people were, were looking for echoes, uh, echoes from, uh, from gravitational waves. So if you have a, an object which mimics a black hole and has a surface, you may expect some echoes of the, of, the, of the gravitational wave. So in our case, we could see some reflection of the emission. And it's a beautiful analysis that shows that if it has a surface, it has to be a complete black body, even though you have all the redshift, the gravitational redshift, but at the end it has to be a black body. And then we, we, we have been able to rule out with our observations that it does not have a high albedo if it has a, a, a reflecting surface, because otherwise the dimmer part of the, of the ring, the central part would be significantly brighter than what we have measured. So we are already, you know, the uh, you know um, ruling out some uh, uh, alternatives uh, to uh, to uh, to care metric uh, from GI and of course this is this is one of the most relevant things we want to study with the HD and NGHT. We have a full working group with you know the most renowned you know black hole physicists in, in the world, which are actually just working on that. And of course for us, uh, this isn't the most relevant. So yeah, understanding you know how jets are formed, understanding. I hope we can start uh, in, in energy from black holes. It's very interesting, but checking whether at some point we are breaks down. Of course, this is this is the ultimate goal of, of this, and this is just the beginning. So, uh, what I also like to say is that think about this for a second. You have two black holes here. We have shown we can image them, and this black hole has been there for hundreds of millions of thousands of millions of years. They're going to be there in the next few hundred million years. So imagine what kind of instruments we will have on Earth for serving these laboratories who are going to be there just for us. So imagine 100 years from now, what kind of instruments, what kind of telescope we will have. So these are the guys who are going to tell us whether, you know, GR holds or not. And, and so it's, it's really, this, as I say, it's just the beginning. I mean, it's only the beginning. It just needs to be there. Yeah, really. Hi, thank you very much for the presentation and congratulations for such an amazing result. I got two questions, one for Antonio and one for Talia. Uh, first, regarding the, the process of constructing the image, you have like several images and you need to uh, average among them to get the final image, right? So could you explain if you weight all the images the same, if you discard some of them when you perform this uh, averaging? Uh, well, first, um, well, you can hear me, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so the, as, as Cindy mentioned, we first trained the, the algorithms with uh, synthetic data and, and then we, uh, we made millions of images uh, of, of uh, this synthetic data, and then we discarded all the all the parameter combinations that were not um, passing a certain threshold uh, regarding the quality of the reconstructed images. Since we saw, since we knew uh, what the the images, uh, the image reconstruction should look like, uh, we we could just uh, discard those that uh, were not good enough, and then uh, we we created these these top set parameters that were able to reconstruct. Uh, each one of these uh, uh, synthetic data sets uh, independently and, uh, you know, uh, accurately enough that uh, if uh, able to, to reconstruct a ring, if it is a ring or, or, or whether these parameters uh, are able to reconstruct a point source, if it is a point source and not making a ring out of a point source or something like that. And with these uh, top set parameter combinations, uh, which are, you know, thousands of thousand them for, for each uh, uh, imaging pipelines, then we uh, 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 image image uh, Sagittarius A star, and and when the, so and this is kind of the, the weighting that we applied for 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 the averaging uh, this this uh, for this uh, combinations that pass this this threshold uh, for for this uh, uh, image that you see on, on the screen. Um, so this is just the average of all these images that pass the threshold. That's it. The same weight. So it's a yeah, uniform with the same, with the same weight. Uh, Okay, so it's a uniform averaging for the ones that pass these tests that uh, you are doing. Okay, thank you. And the other question was uh, regarding this comparison with the magnetohydrodynamics uh, of the plasma surrounding the, the black hole. 
Uh, first of all, the codes for, for such uh, simulations require some initial conditions that I'm curious how you, how you impose those initial conditions for the plasma surrounding the black hole. Well, for, the, for the plasma, we assumed just an ideal plasma. We, uh, we put some constraints for that, and then we left some uh, free parameters like the spin, the, um, the inclination, and all the, uh, and the electron, of course, electron temperature, and so on. And uh, uh, then we test in these constraints how it affects the, the appearance of the black hole. And then we compared this. It was the, the second uh, slide that I, I saw, the second movie. We compared what we obtained of these constraints with, with what actually see in the in the image. For instance, the shape, the size, and also the, the we compared with SEDs so that we simulated and the low frequency uh, uh, appearance image. Okay, and um, what kind of physics does do this code uh, include? Like. Uh... Uh, does include any kind of exotic physics related to the motion of the plasma, or is just standard magnetohydrodynamics in this curved space time? Uh, no, it's a standard uh, magnetohydrodynamics. Yes, so. yes, and actually, worth to mention here that uh, with these simulations, we used five uh, different geometric decodes in order to be as accurate as possible. Uh, could you say it again? Sorry, I didn't catch it. Yeah, sorry, uh, yeah I said that uh, worth to mention that for these simulations uh, that uh, we saw earlier, we used five different Jeremy's decodes in order to be on the safe side that what we uh, obtain is reliable. Okay, thank you very much. And again, congratulations for, for such an amazing result. Thank you. We have the last question, you do. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Okay, uh, congratulations for such a fantastic uh, work and uh, this result. Uh, but uh, sorry for I just uh, listened for half the talk, so I just have some uh, have two basic simple questions. The first question is, uh, uh, I saw the image for the black hole and I'm wondering uh, which is a galaxy disk plane directions and uh, which direction is a black hole rotation directions. This is the first question. And the second question is uh, why there have three bright point on, around the black hole looks uh, symmetric uh, distribute, uh, not like the not like the first image from the M87, that, that one is half dark and half bright. Because I think we are on the galaxy uh, galaxy disk and uh, we just see the see on the rotation. So I, I don't know why the, the three part, uh, three bright part is a symmetri uh, symmetric distribute. So that's the two questions. Uh, the uh, around less than 50 around Sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the other question was, uh, you were asking about these three dots that you see in the image. So as we discussing before, you, you should not pay attention to the brand distribution or anything. But this is this is not well constrained due to the variability of such a uh, and 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 so as we were discussing before, regarding the first question, this is something that I want to find it's very interesting because we see that the orientation of the black hole is not edge on. So the 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 spin of the black hole is not for the middle of the galaxy, but there there should have should have been some different evolution. Of the inner part of the galaxy and, to, and the rest of the, of the galaxy. So we, we, we are seeing this, like, you know, from 30 degrees, which actually is, is in very good agreement with what BLTI observed. So they saw the, they did some asymmetric observation and they seem to be, have followed the polarization of a spot around the SIJ and it, and it was, you know, with a similar, you know, 
almost uh, seen uh, face on. So I think this is going to be also a very interesting uh, piece of information that uh, should be investigated in the future. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you very much to all the person for the team. Thank you very much. Bye bye, thank you. Bye, thanks a lot. Good job. Ciao, Rocco. Ciao, Miguel. Nice to see you. Bye, guys.